Francois, my friend, I missed you yesterday. I didn't have anyone to I didn't have anyone to pick on. I had to sing the closing song to run everybody out. We'll pray for you. Now I'm going to be moving some equipment, so just ignore me. Is it is it going? I believe somebody prayed for me. When I heard that my heart was strangely warm. Thank you so much. Thank you. In uh, two thousand and seven, yeah, I was invited by Prof. Dr. William Shea to come with him and discover the Ark of Noah. So I asked him if I could bring my little friend along. Guess who's my little friend? Little Walter. <laughs> Man, you should travel with Walter. That's a feast. He never complains. <laughs> anyway, we didn't get the Ark, we didn't become famous. But we visited a few places and we didn't know where we were. We just put, took pictures and then we discovered a book at this specific place called Zurats Karar or Karahun. And uh, Walter didn't want to pay the hundred dollars for the book. So I asked the man if he could photograph the book. So Walter, every page. <laughs> and uh, we came home, a shattered dream disappointed and uh, after a year I looked at the slides and I read the book and something strange happened to my heart we were on the place I think where the ark landed so I'm going to present my research and you decide if it's if it's worthwhile. Now what's this? I don't know. Anyway, uh, do you see, see something on this picture? It looks like a huge ship. So I went back there two years later with Loretta and we came here now in 66, when this was first discovered, it was the sensation of the day. We found the ark. Now let's move a bit closer. Now the possibility of this being the ark caused great excitement, as I, I said. And I went down there, coming back I saw a sign, you're not allowed to walk there. But I didn't know. Like many others before me, I do examine this ship-like formation. And guess what? It's just a natural geographical phenomenon. And many other scholars work there. There's nothing. This is not the ark. Well, let's quickly move. By the way, I spoke to Sali. Sali is the famous guide that takes people up to Ararat. By the way, Ararat, according to the biblical definition, is not a mountain. What is it? It's a country, a kingdom. So one of the mountains in Armenia is called Ararat. So everybody goes there. Many of them die in search of the ark. But Sali the guide says there is no ark. 
So let's quickly go to Armenia. This man wrote, They sit like soldiers on a hill, huddled in formation. Look at this. For centuries, this place kept quiet. These stones did not cry out. But today, they cry out. Where is this famous site? It's in Armenia, close to a town called Sisian. It's called Zarats Karar. <coughs> My first sip of water. There's an outside museum, and we visited this. And uh, any messages from these stones? We're looking for arc related information. Where's uh, the technicians? I, I want to get this little thing out here. Thank you. This is the man that didn't want to come on the stage when his girlfriend said his heart was strangely warmed when he saw her. Thank you. <clears throat> Please be more technical in future. <laughs> Now look at this strange writing here. This is the oldest archaeology in the world. It comes from the place where the ark landed. Now, here's another one. Is this a sacrificial one? From the ark, perhaps? And you look at very old inscriptions. Could this be the name of Shem? Now they discovered a few things that help you in your research. The ostracon that was discovered at, at K. Yaffa, a 10th century pot shirt with ancient writing on it. Proto-Canaanite slash Hebrew writing. And then I visited the site in the Sinai desert called Serebit el Kadim. And you also find this proto synaptic script there. So we are getting links in order to decipher <coughs> this language. Well, the second sip. This is the greatest discovery in Armenia in the past few decades. It's also called Karahund, Zurats Karar. And look at this. It's called in Aramaic the Singing Stones. I like this. Uh, are they singing about the story of Noah uh, and the flood and God's love for people? This is the oldest archaeology ever discovered. As uh, I've just said, look at the formation of these stones. Now, it is logic to conclude that the ark came to rest near such a place. I was thinking if, if we could find the oldest archaeology. It's just logic to, to say to yourself, the ark must have landed in a close proximity. Because Noah wouldn't travel a thousand miles in order to settle down because they were living from the wood of the ark. There's no ark left, by the way. Mrs. Noah wanted him to build her a kitchen table and the kids. And they used all the wood. God gave them the wood to continue living. They would have been stupid not using the wood of the ark. Don't you think so? It's logic. Please be logic. As Walter says, man, you've got half a brain. Get a full brain and think. <laughs> Rarely have ancient monuments caused such a sensation in astronomical circles. And this is the book that Walter photographed page by page. And I'm ever thankful to my friend. Now, who's this Heruni? Well, if there's a title or a degree, this man has got it. 
I'm not, only, I'm not even going to read this to you. It's mind-boggling. But here is the greatest brain on this area. They discovered two to three stones at Zorat's Karar. I'm standing at number 63. And I've got new tackies, if you can see it there. Well, what is the meaning of the holes in some of the rocks? About 87 rocks has got holes in it. There's one, and there's one. Now, a study was made of the solstice and the equinox in the past few years. And I'm bringing you the result of their research. <clears throat> Heruni writes, most of the holes are directed to different points in the horizon. They had special techniques to look at this. This used to be telescopes, ancient telescopes. Birthplace of writing, Mathematics, the calendar, and the form of the earth. Stupendous. The oldest archaeology in the world offers you modern signs. I was so excited when I visited here. A number 97 was used in the study of the sun. And you're looking at 90, 97. From here they watch the sunrise and the summer solstice. Sunset and summer solstices were observed from this one, 99. Stones like 63 were used for observing spring and autumn equinoxes as well as for the sunrises and sunsets. There were also holes from which to watch the movements of the moon. This was such a tremendous uh, scientific discovery. Now, I like the way they speak. When they say good morning, or good afternoon, or good evening, they would say, Tzafut Ganem. And we meet an Armenian at Loma Linda. And I said to him, Tzafut Tanem. He pronounces, pronounces it a little different, but that's all right. But Tzafut Tanem means, let me share your pain. I like that. Carry one another's burdens. Tzafut Tanem. Let me carry your pain. Now, the cosmos in ancient Armenian language was called Ast. Now look at this. Minefield of galaxies. The Armenians called God Ast. Ast means universe. Ast Fats, the omn omnipresent one. They were monotheists. If you go far back enough to Noah and his posterity. Ast, as I said, is universe and fats to spread. What a definition, what a description. God is spread everywhere. He's so big, yet small enough to live within my heart. I like to study Armenian history. Let's peep through one of these holes. You're going to see something tremendous. Oh, sorry, it's my... <laughs> it's my child. I prayed for her for nine years. There's an interesting story about Loretta. This was just before we made another interesting discovery. Through one opening, you see more stones with more holes. It was such a complicated mathematics situation here. So I'm looking through a hole, looking at Loretta, and there's a hole, and there's one, and there's another one. Now Noah's posterity studied the night skies and believed in a creator God. I visited another place which is 
Pole, pole, polytheistic. Sure, I battled to get this name out, eh? But I got it. Polytheistic. That mean, means worshipping many gods. But Noah and his immediate family worshipped the God of the universe. Astfats. Does the Bible agree that this is the oldest civilization? Remember, they discovered maths there, signs, the calendar, the form of the earth. It says in Genesis, the sons of Noah who came out of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And I did the lecture on these three gentlemen. These were the three sons of Noah, and from them came the people who were scattered over the earth. So right here is the beginning of a new creation. What about writing? Eruni says the first writing pads were Armenian rocks. Before these rocks, the writing here, there was no writing. Before the flood, no writing. Why not? They were brilliant. If you had a fight with your wife 700 years previously. <laughs> now, Eruni did a tremendous research. It's a bit complicated, but all languages can be traced back to the ancient Armenian writing. Eruni's research is amazing. But what about the statement that the earth is round? Yeah, this is exciting. What do you see here? Please tell me. Yes, people living on a round earth. You're going back to the first archaeology ever discovered. Many textbooks would have to be rewritten. An ancient representation, as you said, this man is clever, you wrote a book as well. Start on your second one. Yeah, this is a commercial for you. I want no commission. <laughs> Not a shoelace, as Walter used to say. Good. <clears throat> now this man, Shirakatsi, he's got a lot of titles. And... Uh, he says in his book, Cosmology and Chronology, that Armenians affirm that the earth is ball-formed and animals live on all sides. This is just after Noah started a new life. They said the earth was round. What else did they believe about the solar system? It's, heli it's heliocentric. Copernicus, Galilee, Galileo, and Kepler made this discovery only in the 1600s. Newton followed them in the 1800s. The Armenians knew it from the time of Noah. Amen. This is Samos, where Pythagoras lived. When he returned to Greece from Armenia in the 6th century BC, he taught that the earth was round. I'm glad the Pope didn't hear this. Here at Zorat's Karar, I ask a question. Who taught ancient Armenians about astronomy and a round planet? Noah and his sons. Heruni writes, to project, build, and use such a stable, accurate instruments for different scientific purposes, it was necessary to have the preliminary accumulated knowledge in astronomy, mathematics, and technology. To have written language, to have high experience in methods of observations and calculations for a long Time, he says 40 years in another page in the book before building Zorat's Karar or a, a Karanju. Now, 
says, a long time. It wasn't a long time. When Noah and his son step out of the ark, they had all that knowledge. And remember, Noah didn't forget the first fight he and Mrs. Noah had. They didn't lose their memories like we lose them. It was a different civilization. Only one source gives us an explanation. And I, I'm reading from an interesting source. It says, in the antediluvian world, there were many wonderful works of art and science. And here we find science, right here. These descendants of Adam, fresh from the hand of God, possessed capabilities and powers that we never now look upon. Read the book Patriarchs and Prophets. I'm convinced that Noah and his descendants brought the science of astronomy to the Ratz Karar. Right here. They couldn't do it. They got the science and they built the first uh, scientific. What is a. Uh, Sterrenwag uh, Walter? Observatory. Yeah. Ancient writing from Uruk, near uh, Ur in the Chaldees, uh, Ur of the Chaldees. What about the art of writing? Initially it was believed that writing originated from Mesopotamia. Wrong. Books will have to be rewritten. Heruni and Matsimiam, another scholar, prove that all alphabets have their origin in Armenian language. Did you get this? All languages had their origin in the Armenian ancient script. Any other sources to verify this statement? Uh, any other source to back it up, as I said? Listen from the book Patriarchs and Prophets. The antediluvians were without books. Wow. They had no written records, but with their great physical and mental vigor, they had strong memories, able to grasp and to retain that which was communicated to them, and in turn to transmit it unimpaired, unimpaired to their posterity. When you believe in the prophet, research in archaeology becomes a pleasure. This is the oldest post-flood observatory. Scholars agree that the calendar was developed here. Are there any biblical evidences that support this supposition? Yeah, Genesis. Here it talks about the week, the day, the month, and the year. There was a calendar before the flood. So all they did, they brought the calendar to the people. And they worked on a calendar. And Hiruni says it should have taken 40 years for the people to develop all the skills to build Zorat's Karar. The cycle of time originated from God. Noah gave it to the post-flood civilization. This is uh, William Shea. I've got great respect for the scholar. He says that there, there should be a mausoleum in this area as well. And uh, Shem could have been buried here at Zorat's Karar. It's also the oldest worship center in Armenia, monotheistic worship. Noah lived another 350 years after the flood. It's a long time. Abram saw him. Uh, was he one of the architects, that's Noah, of this observatory? Was it his passion to teach people about the creator of the universe? Yes. He didn't keep on drinking. He went to the AA and he was delivered from his problem. <laughs> so don't punish the man for one little 
mistake. Did he teach them about the fall of the pre-flood pre world? Yes. Now, unlike Metzamar, the other observatory I visited, the phallus symbol is absent at Zoratskarar. These are the phallus symbols at uh, Metzamor. You know, this is a long lecture, but they asked me to do it in 30 minutes, so I'm rushing through it. Speak to Ray if you've got a complaint. We can assume that Noah settled as close as possible to the place where the ark came to rest. That's just logic. If this is the case, we must search for leads in the adjacent mountains. This is Doga Bayazit near Ararat, the mountain. Where do you prefer to bring the ark to its resting place? Let's just make a comparison. On the dangerous Mount Ararat, where the elephants would roll down, and if Mrs. Noah was a little overweight, she could also follow them coming down. Or a safe haven between the mountains. This is where, according to my research, the ark came to rest. Let's continue. It's called Ucht Asar. Ucht Asar means the mountain of the covenant. Where was the first covenant made? In Armenia, where the ark came to rest. Now, which is the easiest slope from which to descend? This one or this one? Ararat or Ucht Asar? This is easy to walk down. Look at that. This is dangerous. The window of opportunity to visit Ucht Asar mountain of the covenant where the rainbow appeared for the first time is only a few weeks in the heart of the summer available so the two times we went there was July, August Uchasar <clears throat> was hid from human eyes for millennia until just recently you're looking at the youngest archaeology in Armenia. Would this mountain ever reveal his secrets? Yes, it happened. During the Karabakh War, they also have wars in that area, Ashtot Avainkyan was the first man to discover the site. Maybe he wanted to get away from the war, he walked up the mountains, and there he found the site. Well, Walter and myself got into a Lara Russian jeep, and it was so steep, they had to stop, <clears throat> put some water in the radiator, and there we went again. We've got many interesting uh, stories to tell. And maybe we should just have 10 minutes some, somewhere to tell, to tell you some of our stories. Will we see arc-related petroglyphs portraying people and animals? Because these were the two items in the ark. What an exciting journey. 3,300 meters above sea level. Gentle slopes enable you to reach the top. There no problems. On the summit, we parked next to a lake. This is where I believe the ark came to rest. And I wish there are scholars here tonight which could do further research. Let's continue. This huge basin is surrounded by mountains. I didn't have a video camera to show you the surroundings. Could this perfect haven be the place where the ark came to rest? Yeah, I think so. What are we going to discover? We find ancient rock inscriptions up here. We will, yes. This is what they look like. It's called Itzahir. Itzahir, meaning 
goat letters. Let's see if we can find sketches of people on the petroglyphs. Please interpret this picture to me. Are they discouraged, depressed, or are they happy? Man, I think these two people got out of the ark. Yippee, we're out. Could be. People rejoicing. Do you see them? Look here. What message did the original author intended to convey? There's another one. Look at this man's hands. He was working on the planks of the ark, building his wife a kitchen. A little bit of an exaggeration. What else besides people were in the ark? Animals, yeah. Uh, let's look for tombstones on which animals appear. There's one. Some more. More animals. Could this be a primitive representation of the ark? I don't know. I'm still studying this strange language. This is the curator of the place. He's 5,000 years old. <laughs> so let's ask him, Walter, how old are the Itzagir writings? He says almost 5,000 years old, but not older. How many are there? 2,000. And what were they written on tombstones? Who were the people? Who were these people? If you read the Bible story, and by the way, Genesis 1 to 11 is not a myth. It's a fact. This is Walter's friend. My legs are a little thinner than his, but I got to the top. Will we find representations of the fall of man on these petroglyphs? If we could find that, that would say a lot. Let's do a careful investigation. What is this? It's not that. At last. You know, when we got the Bloretta myself the last time, they cannot speak English, but he, he said, Adam Eva. Adam Eva. And I, I took the man by his arm and said, Please show me. And eventually, remember there are 2,000 of these tombstones we got here. This is one of the most important sketches. Now have a very careful look. This picture, according to Haruni, is telling the story of the fall of man. Haruni explains. Do you see a snake? There's a snake. Where do you read about the snake for the first time? Genesis. There's the snake. Tree of good and evil. There it is. Eve taking fruit. There it is. Adam's reaction. Yeah, there he is. My sweetheart, what did you do? Okay. Well, a reminder of the consequences of the first transgression. Here you've got it in stone. Why? It caused the destruction of the planet by water. And one of his sons, or grandsons, or great-grandsons, wrote this on stone. Remember they had no experience of writing till the flood. This is the birthplace of writing. Were the Ixos really the first inventors of the wheel? And there you see wheels. Here Loretta shows it again. There you see it. What about Noah's name? Now William Shea says there is a relationship between proto aritic and proto syniatic script. And I believe him, I checked the hieroglyphics and the ancient languages at the British Museum. Uh, 
looking at this huge basin, the following statement came to my mind. As the waters began to subside, can you imagine the ark here? The Lord caused the ark to drift into a spot protected by a group of mountains that had been preserved by his power. Now if you stand here at Ucht Asar, what is the meaning of Ucht Asar? The mountain of the covenant. When you stand up here, you can see the place is protected by a group of mountains, preserved by his power. Does this fit God's character, this description? These mountains were but a little distance apart. And this is what you see as you look around. They were a little distance apart. And the ark moved about in this quiet haven and was no longer driven upon the boundless ocean. We serve a considerate God. Does it sound logic? And then Ellen White says, This gave great relief to the weary tempest-tossed voyages. It suits God's character. The statement kept ringing in my ears when I visited the site. A spot protected by a group of mountains that had been preserved by his power. This is exactly what my eyes saw. And we had somebody there who read the statement from Patriarchs and Prophets while we looked at the site. The ark, she says, moved about in this quiet haven and was no longer driven upon the boundless ocean. Eventually it came down. What a considerate God. He sends relief when you're on the storm of life, ocean, stormy ocean of life. Ucht Asar, mountain of the covenant. For a time the descendants of Noah continued to dwell among the mountains where the ark had rested. This is interesting. So they dwelt in close proximity of the ark. And that's logic. They could get planks and wood to build their dwellings. Are there tombs to prove this statement? Yes. As I said, 2,000 of them. On top of Ucht Asar you find a basin surrounded by mountains. It could be here that eight people vacated the ark to begin a new life. Nowhere in Armenia do you have a place like this with ancient petroglyphs. Where did they go and live? In close proximity. And they had a gentle slope down to the oldest archaeology ever discovered. Ellen White says, as their numbers increased, Apostasy soon led to division. And that's another lecture to see where they went. And you know, I read uh, on one of the clay tablets the, uh, the story written by a scholar. The Golden Age of Sumer, where an ancient author says, everybody spoke one language, ancient Armenian. And then later he says something happened. <coughs> and how there's a diversity of languages, exactly as the Bible tells us. This is my third sip. It's not too bad, eh? They are praying for me. Do we find traces of polytheism in Armenia? Yes. At the other observatory. I told Loretta that there are weightier issues than identifying the resting place of the ark. This is just by the way. Because it says, Matthew 24, 36, 37, as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. The story of Noah tells us how to escape the coming destruction. And it's important to read the story of Noah. It's not a myth. But Noah found grace 
or favor in the eyes of the Lord. This is the first appearance of this word in the Bible. Saved by what? Grace. Have you accepted God's unmerited gift of forgiveness and salvation? It's a gift. You cannot earn it. How did the acceptance of God's unmerited favor affect his life? And this is very important, and Walter was mentioning this over and over. It says in Genesis 7, 5, And Noah did all that the Lord commanded him. Grace is always followed by obedience. And you can trace this theme throughout the Bible until you get to the end of the Bible. Has the sequence changed? No. One prophet builds on the previous one. There's harmony in scripture. The destruction of our wicked planet is nearer than we can anticipate. How can I escape this cataclysmic event? Jesus is on his way. The angels are using brasso to shine their trumpets and tune them. Heaven is coming down to us. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be. Is grace again extended? Are we going to allow God's grace to change our lives?